Welcome back to Sharing Fire. I'm Dr. Mark Hardy, and this is a show where we talk to people about the great things that are going on in the community and what organizations are doing to make the world a better place. Today, we are with Thomas Harvey, who is a Luke McGinnis Director of Nonprofit Professional Development in the Mendoza College of Business at the University of Notre Dame. Now, we didn't put that whole title on the on the screen because it's too long. <laughs> But, uh, Nicely just, done, though. Uh, thank you. Uh, well done. But uh, Tom is uh, my boss, actually, at Notre Dame, and he has a wealth of experience. He's been in the nonprofit sector for how many years now? Close to 50. Close to 50, and um, brings with him all kinds of knowledge of the service sector, human uh, services sector, and uh, especially Catholic charities. And you've been uh, at Notre Dame about 10 years now. I'm going, going into my 10th year. Wow, that's great. Um, so what... What we decided to talk about today was um, looking at Catholic social teachings, how that informs the nonprofit sector, and, uh, and then how the Catholic Church has been engaged in kind of the evolution of that ever since, bringing us up to, to present day. So can you, can you kind of explain to us what, when we say Catholic social teachings, what does that mean? Okay, uh, Catholic Charities has two histories. One would be a, uh, a group of poor people who came here as immigrants, set up shop, and many of the original agencies that were founded by the Catholic Church had names that reflected the time. The Catholic Welfare Bureau, uh, Catholic Charities itself uh, was a name that as time went on, many of the agencies changed to Catholic Community Service, Catholic Social Service, and wanted to look more at the professional side of human services than the poverty side, okay? So that's one history, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. But Catholic social teaching is something that's very important, but poorly defined. Uh, a lot of people use the term, and they use it as if, well, Catholic social teaching is about moral theology. Uh, if you say you believe, do you live it out? When it really doesn't have much to do with that. In the 19th century, when a lot of economic theory that came with the Industrial Revolution, people like John Locke said private property is an absolute right. People like Adam Smith said the marketplace is going to provide for all people and there will be a hidden hand that guides and make it all work. The Catholic Church through that period, in its world leadership through the Pope, was not in dialogue with anybody. Uh, Locke wrote in the latter part of the 1700s, Adam Smith, same period, up into the 1800s. And it wasn't until 1891 that an old man by the name of Pope Leo XIII wrote what was called the first Catholic social teaching. In Latin, it was known as Rerum Novarum, uh, of new things. Uh, the, it was, that's what that term translates to. But it was basically about the rights of labor as a counterforce to the rights of capital. Now, when you think about it, for thousands of years on every continent, the basis of wealth was basically land. Wars were fought over it and so on. When the Industrial Revolution took place, Capital became the basis of wealth, and it was fluid. So work was separated from the family, and all kind of changes began to take place. And in a sense, there was nobody reflecting to say, what's the value of all this? Well, then these economic forces came forward and established themselves, and tensions built out between the Karl Marxes and the Adam Smiths and the John Locke's. Well, into that dialogue comes the Catholic Church, and it came slowly. The first writing was the counterbalance weight of labor as a right to parallel and to counterbalance the forces of capital. It wasn't until 1931 that the second social teaching came, and it was Pius XI as he looked at fascism in Portugal and Spain and Italy and uh, Nazi national socialism in Germany, communism emerging in Eastern Europe. Uh, he spoke to the needs of people uh, to live in societies where the decisions are made closest to the people who will be affected by them. That became known as the principle of subsidiarity. And it was a wonderful force because it gave us a pulpit, if you will, to speak to these impersonal forces that just wanted government to control things. Mm. However, time goes on. And what if a community is bankrupt? Are you going to rely on its resources and the people closest to the decision making? So late 1950s, Pope John XXIII writes another uh, social teaching 
that talked about the need for communities that don't have resources to be shored up by other resources. And it was at this time a leading Catholic by the name of William Buckley uh, wrote, Mater si magistra no, mother and teacher, because he did not want the economic teachings of his church to get in the way of his comfort level uh, and what's going on. So here we are now with Pope Francis I raising questions about capitalism. He's not saying capitalism is wrong. It's probably the best economic system ever. On the other hand, a lot of people aren't participating. I would love to see a debate between William Buckley and the Pope. Yeah. I think that would be really interesting. I think it's going to have to take place in heaven. I think stage. so too, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but so, so this is not um, theology. This is really kind of policy philosophy um, uh, in the way that the church should approach things on a very pragmatic level. Well, in one sense, I could agree with that. However, uh, the Catholic social teachings, if you read the actual documents, mm -hmm. they're filled with quotes from scripture. They're mm -hmm. filled from teachings out of history because if you start with the principle that all people are created in the image and likeness of God, that means there should be some equality in the way our societies are formed and not just the way you're born. I mean, in our society, which house you're born in will pretty much indicate who goes to Yale and who goes to jail. Right. <laughs> you know, That's a good comes point. Right yeah. Down to it. Yeah. So, so as you move through this with the, the Catholic social teachings, how has that informed the nonprofit sector in terms of like Catholic charities, Catholic hospitals, Catholic social services, or has it? I guess is the question. Well, you know, there are other traditions of nonprofit. And each one of them has something that is of value. Much of that, too, traces itself to Judeo-Christianity. Okay, it might not be the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. but whether you're talking about the Settlement House movement, the whole concept was to create community in the, in the midst of squalor mm -hmm. and lack of opportunity, and then to empower people through community. I mean, that's a concept that resonates very well with Catholic social teaching, and yet it came from Jad a Jane Addams, one of the founders of social work. Mary Richmond, another one of the founders of social work. Uh, she was concerned that people would fall through the cracks and not have a personal way of being known. And so she stressed that anybody who was treated in an agency of the family service system, which was descendant of her thinking, should never be viewed isolated from the family. So even if you're talking about a senior being cared for in a nursing home, they're still part of a family network and the social service provider should relate to that. So I just wanna make that comment that all of the sector is not infused with Catholic social teaching, but it frequently is infused with other values of Judeo-Christianity. The Catholic charity system, uh, we have been very careful to build our uh, a whole philosophy of service for example, we don't believe in proselytizing. Mm -hmm. We believe in proselytizing through parishes, through missionaries, through other ways where there is a power distribution. Mm -hmm. If I go to church, I can listen to someone and say, you know, I really feel comfortable being here. And if I get too uncomfortable, I can get up and leave. I have that kind of power. But if I come to a Catholic Charities Agency and I'm feeling vulnerability, I'm feeling weakness, dependency, it's the obligation of that agency to accept me where I am and to bring me into that service provider without bringing the added burden. The only way you'll be given service is if you show you're a member. The coerciveness of that, right? Yeah, so you know, when you really think about it, the philosophy of Catholic Charities is one where we're quite comfortable having a pluralistic workforce. Mm -hmm. We're quite comfortable having ecumenical boards of directors in many dioceses. Some dioceses are still, well, this is ours, so we want Catholics to run it. But oftentimes, a Catholic Charities Agency will say, we want the people who know the community the best to be on our boards. Uh, we're also very comfortable in taking public money. We realize that when government money is brought forward, it's not to help us attain our mission. It's asking, do you have the tools and resources to help us meet a public objective? That's a very important distinction that makes it possible for Catholic agencies to have 65 cents on every dollar coming from some governmental source. Now that's caused some problems, obviously. There's a lot of controversy around that in terms of getting government funding. And um, I know it's not, not just Catholic uh, organizations, but other religious organizations are struggling with the mandates that are being put upon them. Um, and uh, how are some of the, especially the Catholic organizations, dealing with that at this point? 
Well, as you know, Notre Dame itself is actually suing the government right. because they felt there should have been a, an exemption clause uh, for conscience so that people who work for a truly Catholic organization don't have to get uh, certain insurance benefits that might ask the agency to support something they're uncomfortable with. Um, you know, we haven't had too many of those. We have had a few. Uh, it's unfortunate that this one has gotten to this extent. It would have been much better if we found a compromise early on. Some kind of some Finally, when plan, Obama yeah. realized a lot of his friends weren't running with him on this one, mm -hmm. and that Catholic Charities is a fairly progressive organization that's concerned about the quality of life in the community, do you really want to alienate this group of people? So I, I don't know where that's all going to play out, but I only hope and pray that in a society like ours, uh, we can have an orchestra leader that say everybody doesn't have to be playing the oboe. Right. You know, and that we can have a clarinet, a trumpet, and maybe that'll be the Lutheran, the Catholic, the secular, and, and so on. But it is unfortunate from my perspective that it ever got to this extent. So you, you mentioned William Buckley, which is really interesting in this conversation. Um, was that the beginning of uh, some type of, of a separation of thought in the church? when in the 50s and 60s uh, were, um, you know, you said he didn't want to apply the Catholic um, thought on economics to, to economics, uh, what it sounds like. Was he one of the, the leaders of that? He was one of the first to come forward mm -hmm. because, you know, he had his own show, he had his own magazine, sure. and he was a, a thought person. Mm -hmm. He just happened to be an extremely conservative one, mm -hmm. and he wasn't used to having his faith community speak to some of the issues that he had a very biased view toward. But it wasn't the first. It's rather interesting that when Humane Vitae came out with regard to birth control, uh, people dissented widely uh, from saying this is going to be a very important value in comparison to a lot of others, okay? Now you can't pick and choose, but even the church itself teaches there's different gradations of belief. Jesus being divine, Absolute moral issues that are in 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 a change period. I'll give an example. Uh, people will accommodate, and it will take time for change to take place, either for new ways of thinking or to embrace the old. Okay. Very interesting. There's rarely been any counter type thing other than commentary on the radio, but when it came to economics, Buckley was the first. But later when the same kind of issues were raised by the American bishops, then William Simon had a counter-pastoral. Then the Hoover Institution connected to Stanford University or on the campus of Stanford University wrote a counter-pastoral drawing on other Christian phrases to argue against the kind of inclusivity of community that Catholic social teaching was calling for. So it's interesting. Buckley took on John XXIII in Mater and Magistra but other leading Catholic conservatives down through the years have written and gone to the trouble of trying to formulate an organized way of viewing this problem and putting their own quasi-encyclicals out. That never happened in the sexual agenda. Well, now we move to present day, and we have a pope that is making people shake their heads. So um, what do you think is so unique about him and how do you think he might not only inform uh, the Catholic Church maybe in, in different ways, but the world as a whole? He's, he's caused a lot of uproar. Well, one of the things that I like about this Pope, he picked the name Francis. Nobody had picked that name historically. And yet all of us somehow have this love for Francis of Assisi, who was the son of the emerging wealth of that period of the 12th and 13th century as the mercantile class was coming forward uh, to stand uh, sort of as a balance to the agrarian people, the landowners. And so if you go to Assisi and visit the Basilica, you'll see all of these issues of the temptation that Francis had because he resisted either embracing his father's uh, mercantile class or the big landowners of the time. And so he rejected all of that and, and stood as a symbol. So should we be surprised that a, a Jesuit from Latin America who embraces the name Francis suddenly questions the way money is distributed in society? 
He doesn't say that it's wrong, but he does point out that depending on where you are,